fashion, and now it's uh, quite difficult to get back to work. And so I'm trying to now a bit entertain you, and I'm going to rehash and go. Nevertheless, I hope there is some scientific content inside and all of them. I will be afraid of that. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about the interplay between Orthodox religion and politics in contemporary Russia. And um, this research uh, came out from my previous research, which some of you might know. I was dealing with Russian businessmen and was looking how they affiliate with Russian orthodoxy. And uh, during this research, conducted uh, between 2006 uh, and 2008, I noticed that quite uh, a number of these uh, businessmen, to be honest, uh, most of these high-ranking businessmen, were engaging um, in politics as well. So they had some political ambitions, and so they were trying to make use of uh, orthodoxy uh, in order to fulfill their political ambitions. So they, for example, were giving donations to uh, the deconstruction or erection of church buildings, they were giving money for monuments and other things as well. And uh, this was something which uh, motivated me to uh, look on this uh, interrelation between politics and Russian orthodoxy more closely. And as you see, um, I, I was successful. I applied for funding from the German Research Foundation and uh, received money and had the opportunity to conduct yet another research in Russia. <coughs> now, here you see some of the details. I started my work in 2013, late 2013. And uh, the research, the funding was until 2016. And uh, the topic was, as I've said, the interrelation between Russian orthodoxy and politics. Uh, starting point, because it was no single project, it was uh, related to other projects in, at our university in Magdeburg. And there were political scientists, there were sociologists, and there were uh, people from educational sciences and uh, yeah, many others, and so we started with a quite general point of departure, which was waiver, and the uh, differentiation between power and sort of authority. So we had uh, politics as a process, where we have uh, coherent changes, and um, so I was looking, as you see in the research question, exactly at this interrelation between politics and orthodox religion. Um, yeah, the main field site of my research uh, is the city of Vladimir, which is uh, situated about 200 kilometers uh, east of Moscow and has about 350,000 inhabitants and is uh, very well known for its historic importance, as all of you might know. Nevertheless, uh, it's a quite, let's say, usual Russian city in many respects because it's not uh, very different from uh, other cities like uh, Ivon, Ivanov, which is very close, or Rostov, which is in the southern part of uh, Russia. And in addition, uh, one of my assistants conducted research in St. Petersburg. Uh, and most of the issues I was <coughs> uh, raised in Vladimir were quite similar in St. Petersburg region. So, although it's an ethnographic research, I'm an anthropologist, social anthropologist, uh, it's something I think it's relevant for at least European Russia and the mainland Orthodox country. Um, what I did, as I've said, I'm a social anthropologist. I conducted uh, ethnographic field work. I uh, uh, did a participant observation. I was um, yeah, attending yeah, services. I was going on pilgrimages. I was uh, attending uh, festive days. And I was, uh, yeah, at political sessions, I had many opportunities to, to really look what people are doing and um, yeah, follow this and yeah, make notes and all these things. In addition, I had some CE structured interviews in order to uh, get things in more detail. And as you see, there are a number of politicians from religion and from political side. And um, yeah, I really try to use this material. Um, as it's used in social anthropology, I was following the ethnographic research cycle, which is one opportunity. Uh, this means you are studying very broad. As you see from the research question, uh, orthodox religion and politics is a really huge topic. And uh, so I started, um, was using ethnographic questions, collecting data, was trying to report all these things, uh, was analyzing this data, and from this data, 
sort of the publication immediately uh, late. But I was uh, asking you ethnographic questions. I was looking uh, at things in more detail, and um, so things became more focused uh, during the yeah three years uh, of research. So how uh, come religion and politics? Uh, if you look at the recent approaches, um, you might notice that there is a focus on the notion of belief, and there is a big anthropological discussion. <coughs> Sorry, from getting the cold. Um, there is a big ethnographic or anthropological discussion <coughs> criticizing this uh, very issue of belief, and um, this is also very relevant for Russian orthodoxy because. Um, as all of you might know, Russian orthodoxy is not only rooted in belief, but also in practice and in the notion of uh, adherence to one community. So I was uh, criticizing this idea of uh, looking only at belief. Uh, in addition, I was um, there's a yeah, really huge kind of literature on uh, the higher economics of power. So we have a lot of things which are published on Putin and patriarchy. There are many um, people dealing with this issue. And um, I think this is a bit more problematic because from my point of view, things on the local uh, level are quite different. And in addition, I don't know if these people really have access to uh, such figures such as President Putin or Patriarch Kirill. I mean, you can recall all these uh, public talks and all these things which are written and circulated, but uh, to see how things really are on the ground, look at the practice, I think it's very relevant to look at the local situation and to meet these people who are not so reluctant to yeah, talk more. Uh, in addition, I was criticizing this uh, focus on church and state. So I had a more yeah, broader approach to this topic, and so I was not looking at people affiliated with Russian Orthodox Church only, but with uh, the fear of uh, Russian Orthodox being more broken, and also politics as well. Um, in addition, I was uh, as I said, I started with this uh, Bulgarian idea. I was looking how my initial idea was to look at uh, these things between uh, power and authority and to have something like authority during the socialist times, having uh, loose structures of power during the post socialist years, during the early post socialist years, and having more structured uh, power relations later on during the Putin years, um, and to, to see how religion might be related to this issue. However, it came that uh, if you are looking at this uh, in, in a Bulgarian way, uh, you, look, uh, you end up with something to, to look at uh, how religion might legitimate uh, politics. So you have the opportunity either to say religion is legitimating politics or it's the other way around, it's uh, de legitimizing politics. And I think that's uh, quite um, controversial in my eyes because um, if you look at it like this, you lose it, uh, a lot because you cannot um, address religion in its own right, so to say. You uh, cannot look uh, what people are really thinking about, what is religious about these issues, and so on. And there's also a yeah, anthropological discussion on this issue. For example, if you look at, the, at Islam, if you look at the veiling of women, for example, of course this has uh, political consequences, but the reasons for veiling might be related to belief, they might be related to tradition, they might be related to identity. So there are many issues. So if you're looking at this uh, legitimacy, uh, legitimacy alone, you lose a lot. That's my opinion. So, <coughs> in addition, I'm criticizing this uh, very notion of uh, the Zapotapism, which has uh, its roots in Protestantism. And as you see here, yeah, it has a lot of uh, things, very, uh, very yeah, clearly say it's politics which is dominating religion and uh, it's using it for its own sake. So um, it's religion is an instrument of the state. And I'm criticizing this because, um, as I've said before, if you look at uh, religion in a broader perspective, you receive much more. In addition, uh, I'm very critical of the idea of uh, symphonia, this uh, idea of harmony between uh, orthodox religion and politics. Uh, this is something which um, yeah, focuses on the cooperation of politics and religion for a, a common goal. But, uh, to be honest, and as, uh, for example, Kyrgyz Hongkong and others uh, uh, quite convincingly argued, uh, this was always an ideal. It never was practiced uh, in real life, 
and there was always uh, some kind of not only cooperation, but there was conflict, there was competition, and so on. And so um, I was not using this concept of symphonia, and also um, would like to emphasize the issue that um, symphonia in itself were, was changing very much already during the Byzantine times and uh, much more later on during the Ottoman Empire and so on. So, what I'm, yeah, my ideas instead, what I'm trying to, uh, to argue for, um, I use this idea of entanglement, so I'm using this notion of entanglement between politics and religion. This might uh, look very much uh, like other things, but um, the results uh, may very much look uh, very much the same, but they have quite um, different understandings and notions how this works. And uh, according to my perception, uh, contemporary Russia, at least on the local level, you have uh, two centers of power. And you have uh, politics and Russian orthodoxy. And if you start to, to look at this at the local level, it's quite uh, difficult to say in advance who is going to win if there's any competition or conflict. So it might be um, successful for the religious side, it might be also successful for the political side. Um, yeah, as I've said, on the local level there's no clear dominance, and you have um, cooperation, competition, and conflict, all these three aspects. Uh, in addition, if you're talking about entanglement, um, I think you have to be more precise. And so um, my idea was to suggest um, something more, and at least to uh, differentiate between three aspects of uh, entanglement and see some of these uh, ideological conversions, these personal entanglements, and in addition, these things institutional entanglement. Yeah, what I hope for is to yeah, access uh, Russian authority in its own right and to look at uh, what's really going on and how people uh, adhere to Russian authority and how they relate to the political sphere. Okay, now this was, so to speak, the theoretical part and now I would like to show you some of the ethnographical examples which I recorded during my field trip. And, um, okay, in particular, uh, I had four uh, topics which are, I was analyzing. You see, uh, it, it was an outcome of this ethnographic research cycle, so this was not selected in advance, but these were the topics which were coming out during the research, and um, these were the topics which were discussed by the people on the ground and which were very relevant for them. And so I was looking at this religious education in public schools, which I, uh, yeah. uh, in addition I was looking at this restitution of property to religious organizations, and in particular to the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, a third topic was related to these uh, festive days. There were uh, a number of festive days, like the Day of National Unity, or the Day of uh, Family Love and Faithfulness, which have both uh, political and religious consequences. And uh, last but not least, I was looking at the religious conservatism and its relation to politics. If it comes to ideological entanglements, you see a wonderful picture. This is, so to speak, Ruskaya uh, Kasatan, and this is a Russian, very beautiful country. It's the main cathedral of Vladimir. And my idea is um, if you have it uh, like this, there's an ongoing process of uh, beautification of Russian cities. And there are attempts to really create an authentic Russia. So a picture of an authentic Russia. And this is at the very heart of this uh, um, notion of an authentic Russia. These are these golden domes of these churches. And it's not only relevant in Vladimir. There are other examples from Joshka Hola and from uh, St. Petersburg, from Moscow, and from many other cities. If it comes to Vladimir, you see uh, these dots on this uh, map, it's the uh, center of Vladimir. Um, keeping in mind that uh, almost no church was working uh, at the end of socialism, you see these red dots. These are the churches which were functioning in 2016, and these uh, yellow ones, which were under construction or under recon uh, yeah, in, uh, were erected as new monuments. So you see it's a very massive uh, movement, and you have uh, really this uh, idea of uh, making something new, and I call this a uh, palimpsest, which means it's from um, yeah, philological science, it's uh, related to this uh, old, um, yeah, for example, to Egypt, where you had uh, these uh, papyrus papers, 
and things were written on this uh, papyrus afterwards because it was very precious, it was erased, and something new was uh, written on this uh, papyrus. But at the end of the day, there were new issues, but the old ones were not completely erased. And here it's uh, similar, because uh, this is why I relate to this as Paul says. So you have the socialist uh, history, it's very present. You still have uh, Lenin and other things which are around, but there's a massive movement to have these new monuments, these new religious uh, science, and it's, it's an attempt to make something new, and I call this time uh, Another ideological entanglement is this uh, reframing of the history. So that's from the Orthodox school of Vladimir. These are fourth class uh, students or pupils. Uh, from this orthodox school and from another attractant uh, public school and they were remembering the 100th anniversary of the starting of World War I and as you see, uh, they have quite some um, yeah, army uh, outlooks, they are showing uh, Nikolai II in the back and you have also this uh, banner which is saying by Nato Papiet Nova Kansa, so we uh, uh, war until a victorious end do you see uh, all these pictures from these uh, pre socialist times are now coming back and uh, are transmitted to these people, uh, to these pupils which are about 10 years old? And I think that might be very problematic. But it's also something which uh, um, is also relevant for political side and also for uh, religious actors because during these events we have people from state uh, administration and from religious uh, institutions. So both sides were quite. Uh, yeah, conversion on this issue. To sum this um, ideas up, so you have um, some ideas of what is uh, the basis of this ideology, and I think we have quite some uh, work on this issue, how this uh, ideological convergence is working, and you see um, orthodoxy is framed as the uh, sole basis of uh, Russianness, you have a uh, denigration of the West and of uh, other things such as liberalism, democracy, and um, yeah, things which are related to this, and it's uh, um, essentializing what is Russian and what is US. And um, yeah, I try to yeah, use this as a basis and call this ideological conversions. Uh, in addition, I was focusing on personal entanglements. Here you see the head of the district of uh, Murom, and uh, he is um, congratulating for the day of family love and faithfulness. But he's not only uh, showing his picture all over the city of Moon, but he's also using the opportunity to meet with the uh, head of the monastery. And um, as you see on the next page, page um, they were also exchanging gifts. So the mayor, or the, the head of the district, was bringing flowers and other presents. And the last picture, uh, he was receiving an icon in return. So they uh, try to use this opportunity, like, such as this festive day, to um, yeah, initiate new projects, to discuss their ideas, to exchange their views, and to uh, do something which is more relevant for Russian society uh, in general. What is the outcome of this? Uh, I call this institutional entanglements. For example, the introduction of uh, religious education in state schools is one of these uh, very key issues. In addition, there are a number of um, other institutions, here for example, it's, uh, there are a couple of institutions dealing with uh, traditional family values, and these are the signs of uh, Peter and the Pergima of Murum, and there's a whole movement of erecting uh, monuments all for the Russian Federation, here you have one in, um, in Murum, but you have other ones in Serbia for some, for example, and so there are attempts to really distribute it all over the country. And these are made to some kind of institutionalization. So, uh, as I said before, uh, <laughs> we have uh, cooperation in conflict and in addition unintended consequences. I think this is very well known. All of you might have seen such a picture, very nice, very cooperative. But you have other things as well. You have conflict. This is the monastery of Bogodirovo, uh, close to Vladimir. Uh, you have the monastic complex. Which is also here we have a museum, which uh, there are some really uh, deep conflicts, and in addition, of course, this before the revolution also belonged to the monastery, so they were trying to restitute this uh, land as well. But the problem is here is the hospital of the city of Pogodyrovo, and there were uh, quite some severe conflicts between this monastery and the local administration. 
in addition, you have a number of unintended consequences. And uh, as you have seen here, this is a day of uh, um, family love and gracefulness. So you get uh, quite some attraction. And many people are visiting the relics of uh, Peter and Petronia as they're visit visiting the city of Mura. But uh, the festive day on 8th of July is uh, situated in Boston time. So there's no opportunity to conduct weddings during this time. But uh, due to this uh, attraction, many people are visiting uh, Muron, trying to uh, conduct their weddings here, and have to notice that it's not possible. Due to this reason, they uh, invented a new festive day in September as an additional festive day. But it's often known to anyone. And, yeah, it's some sort of un unintended consequence. To sum this up, uh, what I've said before, so you have not only things from above, you have also local initiatives, you have um, no strict hierarchies, you have open competition, and as I said, I was uh, focusing on these uh, three dimensions of this entanglement, and I was trying to show that you have conflict, competition, and uh, cooperation. Okay, these are the sources I'm trying on. Um, these are the things published yet. The only thing which is uh, forthcoming is this monograph, which will uh, appear later here with this project. So, thank you very much for your attention.